Okay, is this working? Can you hear me all the way in the back? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so my job is to give you a, a, a hand, uh, three lectures on uh, the physics of neutrinos. And uh, these lectures will probably be very different from the other two lectures you've seen so far. I will talk a lot about uh, history of neutrino physics. I'll also talk about experiments a lot. So hopefully you won't be too bored. Uh, and the most important thing to always remember with these lectures is if you do have questions, please ask questions. You may have noticed from almost all the lectures that we like to talk a lot, which is true. So if you don't ask questions, people will just keep on talking very, very quickly. So you don't want that. OK, so let's keep that in mind. And I'll mostly be showing slides, but I'll be writing a lot of stuff on the blackboard as well. So hopefully this is going to work out, and it won't be too distracting. OK, so this is mostly what I'll try to tell you about. Uh, what I'll do mostly today is to give you a very condensed history of everything that we know about neutrinos until maybe about 20 years ago. Then I'll spend a reasonable amount of time reminding you or telling you in case you don't follow this kind of physics why neutrinos are so exciting today. They are among the most exciting things going on in particle physics today, if you ask me. So. Then I'll talk about the physics of neutrino oscillations, which is this new phenomenon that we learned. And uh, I'll try to give you the big picture of where we stand with understanding neutrinos today. And I'll try to highlight what are the things about neutrinos that we haven't learned yet. And then towards the very end, I'll try to go into a little bit of detail about the physics of giving neutrinos a non-zero mass. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll discuss some concrete ideas and so on. So uh, since you're going to have access to these slides at some point, here's a very incomplete, very, very biased list of uh, places you can learn more about neutrinos. I do want to highlight the very last one. This is a website kept by Carlo Giunti from Torino. And he has a lot of uh, references on neutrino physics. He also has a book on neutrino physics. And you might want to check that one out as well. Uh, OK. So let's get started. So I want to give you a sense of uh, a little bit of the history of particle physics, especially when it comes to understanding neutrino physics. Neutrino physics is a very old subject. It was always a very, very confusing subject. And I want to give you a sense that uh, resolving certain problems in particle physics can take a very, very long time. And this is true even more than 100 years ago. So I do want you to keep that in mind. For those of you that are very, very impatient and they want to find new physics tomorrow, like me, it's very important to keep in mind the history of particle physics and the fact that we learn something fundamentally new or very, very important every once in a while. But we don't get to do it on a yearly basis. So that's uh, something I want to try to keep in mind. So I want to start this story in a place that, oh, and, and I should say the following. Most everything that I will say today will be very, very basic. So don't be offended if you feel like you know everything. On the flip side, people tend to be very happy when they hear about things that they already know, because it makes you feel good. Oh, I already know this, so I can pay attention. Uh, so, but, but, but please ask questions. And if I say something that's wrong, which I will, you should correct me as well. Okay, so this is very important. So I want to start out uh, in the beginning, of, or, or in the end of the 19th century, by the turn of the century, this is sort of when particle physics uh, starts. If you want to identify when does something that smells like particle physics began, it's probably around those, those times. There's a very important date in 1897, which is when the first fundamental particle was identified. And that's when somebody figured out that electrons exist by doing an experiment, which is a really cool experiment, which I won't tell you about, but you should know about it. And if you don't know about it, you should look it up. And that's when the electron was discovered in these experiments with cathode rays. It turns out that the year before, uh, there's another very important discovery, which is a very weird phenomenon, which is uh, naturally occurring radioactivity. And this is where the history of neutrinos, in some sense, starts. So let me remind you of this story, which hopefully many of you learned in like uh, high school or whatever the equivalent of high school is. And the idea is uh, people were studying uh, objects that emit radiation when you expose them to some source. 
So we're very familiar with this. We know that if you take like a piece of coal and you heat it up, it emits uh, heat as well, which is nice. So that's some. The other thing that happens is that some materials will also emit some uh, measurable energy when you expose them to light. So there's this phenomenon called the phosphorescence. And some things are phosphorescent, which means that you expose them to light and then they, they glow. So let's put it that way. So the story goes, and I'll tell you the story very quickly. So there's this French guy who lived in Paris, and he was doing experiment with one of these phos phosphorescent materials. It's some compound that contains uranium. And the idea is a very simple experiment. You know, so you take this uranium, you expose it to light, and then you bring it back to your office. They didn't have labs back then. They all have offices. So, so you bring it back to your office, and he used to do experiments with a photographic plates. Uh, one thing you might know is photographic plates already existed back then. This was a very, very big deal for science, it turns out. Both for things like astronomy, because you could take a picture of a star instead of just looking at it, which is kind of a big deal. And uh, you can also use that to study materials. And this is how you'd study these materials. You take your uranium, you would expose it to some photographic plate. You know, you would leave it out in the sun. You would bring it back in, expose it to some photographic plate, and then you would measure how much uh, it is uh, irradiating something, okay, some energy. So one day he was going to do his experiment, and the weather was bad, so he couldn't do the experiment. And this happens a lot in Paris, so that's fine. So he went to do his experiment. He came back into the lab. He actually had to go on a trip, so he put his sample inside of a drawer in, a, in his desk, and then he went away for a couple of weeks. And then a very long time later, he remembered that he had left the sample inside of his drawer for a long time. And then he found out that he had left his sample on top of a photographic plate. And uh, he decided that you know, he had left it there for a long time. He didn't know if the photographic plates were good or not. So he decided to develop them. And basically what he found out, and there's some pictures of this. So here's, a, here's his little box. Here's a photographic plate. And the box was sitting right here. So when you develop the photographic plate, you see a, a, a signal of something. You know, that the, the, this uh, box of uranium was emitting some radiation. And this was very puzzling because he hadn't left it out in the sun for it to do that. So basically, the discovery that they made is that this piece of material was emitted radiation by itself. You didn't have to do anything. But somehow, this piece of material was capable of emitting energy uh, uh, spontaneously without you doing anything. So this is this very, very big discovery. We had no idea that this could happen. It, yeah? Is it very? Uh, no, this is, uh, these are things you can find on the street. The harmful experiments happen later. Uh, when people started to study what this does. So, so the next question you ask is, so what is going on here? And then you find out that there's something that's being emitted by this material. So now we want to study this. So we want to find out what it is that this material is doing, and oh, hopefully, ultimately, we want to find out how it's doing that. And then what people did is then they decided to study this in detail. And one thing which you must all know by now is that uh, there are three kinds of radiation. And people figured this out experimentally. This is a completely experimental fact. And they found out that there are three kinds of radiation. They were given boring names. One is called the alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation, for totally obvious reasons. And these things are classified in a couple of different ways. One is that you can take this radiation, and you can place it in a magnetic field. So what you do is you take your little box of uranium, you uh, surround it with something so that the radiation is forced to go in a fixed direction. Then you put a magnetic field somewhere, like here. And then you put the photographic plate over here. And then you ask, what does the radiation do? And you find out that there's one kind of radiation that does this. There's another kind that does this. And then there's another kind that does that. And these are alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Okay? 
Now, they actually figured out more stuff. One thing that they figured out, of course, is that uh, alpha radiation was very, very easy to stop. So if you put a barrier here, like a piece of paper, uh, the alpha radiation stops before it makes it to the photographic plate. The other thing that they found out about the alpha radiation is that uh, it would bend in the magnetic field, but not by a huge lot. And the interpretation we have for that is that whatever makes up that radiation is relatively heavy. Beta radiation, on the other hand, is a little bit harder to stop. It bends the opposite way of the alpha radiation, uh, and it's pretty light. Okay, so these are the things that we know. And finally, there's gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is super hard to stop, and it doesn't bend. This is what people knew. And at the same time, uh, once you can make a measurement like this, you can also measure the energy of the radiation that's coming out. You know, if you pretend that this radiation is made out of some object that has mass, you can calculate its kinetic energy. And uh, by doing that, uh, people figured out that, for example, almost all the alpha radiation that would come out of some material would have some characteristic energies. You know, it, it would like be a monochromatic radiation. All of the energy has, all of the energies are the same. The same is also true of gamma radiation. And beta radiation, it was more weird. And it took people a very long time to figure out what was going on with beta radiation. And that's the story that we want to follow up by uh, uh, figuring out how did people study beta radiation. So again, this is in 1896. They identified all these different kinds of radiation very quickly. What they also decided to do was to figure out which materials were good at emitting radiation. And that's where the very dangerous experiments started to happen. Because of course, what you needed to do to study that is to get a lot of that material that emits radiation. And then you want to study it. And, and sadly, it turns out that the radiation is not good for you. And people learned that over the next uh, 40 years or so. And, and some people learned that the hard way. OK. So this is, again, in 1896. One challenge that people were facing was to understand the spectrum of beta radiation. And again, the idea is very simple in terms of, uh, of doing the experiment. Again, you know, let's say that you have a source of beta radiation over here. And then you want to measure the energy that comes out. And one question you want to have is, uh, what kind of an energy spectrum do you have? OK, so that part, that's a simple question. You know, so you want to make a plot of, uh, I don't know, number of events uh, as a function of energy in some units uh, as a function of energy. And, uh, there are two qualitatively different things that can happen. One is that you're going to get some uh, uh, lines. And the other one is that you're going to get something that looks like this. OK, these are two qualitatively different things that can happen. And one thing which is very important to know, even if you know the story very well, is that it took about uh, 20 years to figure out what the spectrum looked like, just from a measurement perspective. One thing is that these measurements are hard. And the way you want to imagine this is that you're really literally doing this on top of a photographic plate. So you have your sample here. You put a magnetic field. So your electrons are going to come in. And beta radiation, by the way, are electrons. People figured that out quickly. And the, you know, the radiation is kind of doing that. And it's hitting your photographic plate at different places. And you need a lot of exposure to figure out if you have these uh, uh, sharp lines or if you have these continua as well. The other thing is uh, a lot of the early measurements look like a continuum. That means that it looked like a, a, a continuous spectrum. And people were very puzzled by that. And uh, it took, again, uh, until 1914, until somebody did some very, very cute measurements and very clever experimental techniques to figure out and convince everybody that the spectrum of beta radiation uh, was actually continuous. Okay. This is a difficult thing to do experimentally. And, uh, and people were very, very puzzled because all of this is going on in this uh, first couple of uh, decades in the 20th century, where at the same time, people were figuring out what quantum mechanics was. And uh, 
the one thing that I want to remind you of about quantum mechanics is the first bullet there at the bottom. And uh, quantum mechanics has started out from lots of different places. One place that you are probably familiar with is when people started measuring uh, line spectra. You know, so when you, you know, material emits radiation. And if you measure the frequency of the radiation, uh, that frequency is quantized. But what that means is that you only get certain colors, right? And hopefully, uh, if you have seen experiments, you can actually do the experiment of measuring the different frequencies of light that are come out of the emission of anything. And you always get these very nice lines. And that's part of the reason it's called quantum mechanics, because you want to explain why certain energies are better than others, let's say. And, and materials can only emit in certain frequencies. And that's what that was characteristic of atomic phenomena. And, and here was this other phenomenon, which was beta radiation, which was not quantized. It looked like you could get any kind of energy you wanted. OK, so this is problem number one. If you want, this is a philosophical problem. Because if you see a new phenomenon that doesn't look like an old phenomenon, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's different. There's a much more complicated problem with beta radiation that uh, everybody was also aware of early on, was that if you looked at the kinematics of beta radiation, uh, it seemed to be violating uh, energy momentum conservation by a lot. Okay? So once you figure out what beta radiation is, beta radiation is a physics process where you have a nucleus that converts into a different nucleus by emitting an electron. So the kinematics of this is very, very simple. And in reality, if you knew everything very, very well, you could calculate the energy of the electron that comes out exactly. There's a little bit of a fudge factor because of the recoil of the nucleus. You can take that into account. So what you really expect out of your experiment, if you did this measurement, you would expect to see a very big peak right over here. So this is what your calculation tells you. It says that, look, uh, the electron that comes out must have this energy. And when you go out and you make the measurement, the electron actually has all kinds of energies. And they're all less than the energy that you expected. So this is kind of where people were. And that's why it took them a very long time to believe that this was the right answer, that this uh, spectrum was the right answer. There are lots of things you can be suspicious of when you're making this measurement of beta radiation. The most obvious one, it turns out, is, uh, you know, so, so I have some material here. This uh, electron wants to come out. And you could postulate that maybe as the electron is leaving your sample, it's kind of hitting stuff around, and then it's losing a little bit of energy, a little bit of energy that way. That sounds totally plausible. Okay? And that's what people suspected for a very long time. And that's why it took people about 20 years to convince themselves that this wasn't happening. Now, how do you do that? You have to be super clever. There are lots of things you can do. You can change the size of your sample. You can change the shape of your sample. Uh, if the electron were losing energy as it's coming out, that energy has to be going somewhere. So you know, imagine that your sample would have to like, heat up, and maybe you could measure that. So people worked on that. And, um, and at the end of the day, by the 1920s for sure, they were very, very sure that this uh, beta radiation was very weird. OK? So uh, by the time we're getting to like the 1930s, that's when people were starting to take a serious stab at building a model for nuclei. And uh, so I want to give you a, a primer of how nuclear physics looked like uh, by the 1920s. They were actually rather sophisticated. They had a model that worked very well for many things. And then they had some big problems. So I want to give you a sense of what the model was like. So people figured out that uh, they could measure the masses of nuclei like uh, you know, hydrogen, helium, beryllium, lithium, et cetera, et cetera. There's no periodic table in this room. There could be. So imagine there was one in your classroom. There might be one. So you know all those nuclei. 
people figured out very quickly that the masses of those nuclei were almost uh, in units of the proton mass. Right, you know, the helium has four units of the proton mass. So the mass model people had for the nucleus was to say that the nucleus was a collection of protons. And of course, if you do that, the charge doesn't work out. So even though helium has a mass, which is a four times the proton mass, it only has a charge which is twice the proton charge. So we can fix that by adding a couple of electrons inside of the nucleus as well. So basically, nuclei were made out of protons and electrons. That was good because uh, we knew that sometimes nuclei could spit electrons out. So that was the model. And this model would work very, very well for many things. So for example, so helium-4 was like a four protons and two electrons bound by some mysterious nuclear force we hadn't figured out yet. The problem is that you could take this further and then you could talk about other nuclei. So one other famous or infamous nucleus is like nitrogen-14. And nitrogen-14 would be made out of 14 protons and seven electrons. Now here's actually where people had a problem because uh, if you look at 14 protons and seven electrons, you can ask the, uh, what kind of a particle is that? And uh, the question means uh, you can ask what's the spin of that? And, and we don't know, but we're very, very sure that it's something plus a half, right? Because it has an odd number of fermions. So the total spin of that is a, a, a half integer uh, spin, which means, for example, that nitrogen-14 is a fermion. That's a prediction you can make. And sadly, that's wrong. So nitrogen-14 is not a fermion, it's a boson. And people knew that. Don't ask me how they knew that, but they had information on that. You know, the chemists know how to do stuff, too, so they knew that that was a boson. So that was one big problem, is that uh, nuclei as constructed that way, seem to violate the spin statistics theorem, which is not a small thing, it's a big deal. Another thing which is, uh, there's a problem with magnetic moments. We all know about magnetic moments. It's whatever happens to your spin when you place it in a magnetic field. It's how much energy you gain by aligning yourself with the magnetic field. And one thing that we knew by making measurements is that uh, the spin, or uh, the magnetic moment of the proton is way smaller than the magnetic moment of the electron. That's a fact. And if you measure the magnetic moment of certain nuclei, those magnetic moments are of order the proton magnetic moment, which is way smaller than the electron magnetic moment. So it was very hard to understand how can the nucleus have all of these electrons in it, but somehow the contribution to the magnetic moment is a tiny from the electrons. So that was kind of weird. You always had to kind of um, convince yourself that the electrons had to align perfectly, but then if you had a leftover electron, it wouldn't work out. So it was not quantitatively working very well. So again, uh, what's the solution to this very big problem? And uh, the answer is people had absolutely no idea. One very popular solution, which was uh, championed by people like Niels Bohr and other famous people at the time, was that maybe when you have these bound electrons inside of a nucleus, uh, they behave in a weird way. So bound electrons do not obey the same laws of physics as uh, free electrons. That was the model. And uh, that's a really, really crappy model. Okay, but that's what they could do. And one thing which I always like to remind people is, uh, even though I'm sure half of you must have heard versions of this story before, and even though it sounds like a totally crazy idea to believe uh, weird stuff, uh, this is the best that people could do in the 1920s. And uh, one thing which I always like to quote is the, at the very bottom of the slide there, there's a quote from uh, George Gamow. And uh, basically he's talking about uh, uh, bound electrons, and he was talking about the beta spectrum. And uh, what he's saying is that in order to explain this spectrum here, you have to violate the conservation of energy and momentum. And what he's saying is, you know, if you got to that part of the book and you've learned all the other weird things that bound electrons have to do, which is they have to violate the spin statistics theorem and they have to uh, uh, have a very, very small magnetic moment, 
uh, it's not a surprise that they have to violate energy and momentum conservation because they do all kinds of wrong things anyway, so they might as well do this other one wrong thing as well. Now, this is a quote by George Gamow, who's a very famous uh, physicist in the early 20th century. He did lots of uh, very important things. He was also known for being sort of a funny guy that told lots of jokes. And, uh, but on the other hand, this is from a textbook. It's not like he wrote this in an article or something like that. This was a nuclear physics textbook where people were really questioning whether uh, uh, nuclear physics was really strange. OK, so now uh, I will tell you the, the solution to all of these problems that happened in the early 1930s. And this is where neutrinos come in. So, Neutrinos were invented in 1930, in December, to be more exact. And they were invented to explain why these uh, beta spectrum look like that. And they were also invented to solve some of these other problems that people had with nuclear physics. Now, the key thing is uh, the neutrino was a theoretical idea by Pauli. And basically what he did was, in order to explain why the spectrum is continuous, he invented a new particle. This is another very famous story that, again, I will make the assumption that at least half of you have heard this story before, but I'll just start tell you the story very quickly. So again, there was a nuclear physics uh, convention in, uh, I always forget, Zurich, I think, someplace in Northern Europe. And, uh, and Pauli didn't go to the conference, but he wrote a letter and he gave it to his friend, so his friend would go in the conference and read the letter. And that was his talk, so it's a good talk. So he went up and he read Pauli's letter, and I have uh, an English translation of that here. And it's a super famous letter. The real letter is in German, so I'm not gonna try to read that because I don't know any German. Uh, it, it is famous for lots and lots of things, and a lot of it has to do with stuff that I've already told you, so it starts, so Pali was also trying to be funny every once in a while. So it starts with this, uh, dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen. Uh, basically, what's happening here is that he's uh, reminding people what the problems were. First of all, he says he's come up with a desperate solution to the wrong statistics of nitrogen-14 and lithium-6 nuclei, as well as the continuous beta spectrum. So these are these two problems I've been telling you about. One is that the spin statistics theorem doesn't work for nuclei and that beta radiation is continuous. And also he wants to say, in order to save the alternation law statistics and the energy law. So the energy law, of course, is uh, energy momentum conservation. And this alternation law statistics is, of course, uh, the Pauli principle. Of course, if you're Pauli, you can't call it the Pauli principle. It's not allowed. So you have to give it some name. So basically what he's going to do is he's going to postulate that there's a new particle which also lives inside of, the, uh, inside of the nucleus. And that particle has no charge. And uh, again, it's going to live inside of the nucleus. And it also has spin one half, like the electron and the proton. So that way, by adding some of these uh, neutral particles inside of the nucleus that also have spin one half, you can add the right amount in order to solve this uh, spin statistics theorem problem. That's good, and that's his model. Now, Pauli is a phenomenologist, so he knows that he has to be in agreement with other experimental data. So he's gonna use experimental data to constrain his new particle that he's just invented. One is, this particle better not be super heavy, because if it were heavy, it would make the nuclei much heavier than they should be, so they have to be lighter than something. So that's one uh, constraint. Like I said, it has to have spin one half. And the other thing, of course, is that we haven't seen this particle do anything, so it better not interact very much. And if you keep reading the letter, that's effectively what he's doing uh, in the rest of the letter. He's basically saying this thing has to be light and it can't interact very much. And uh, he puts some very loose bounds on what things look like. And one thing which is very important to also appreciate from a historical perspective, uh, that particle was called the neutron for completely obvious reasons. You had a proton, you had an electron, 
So it had to end in on because it sounded Greek, and it didn't have any, ma any charge, so it was a neutron. So very simple. So this is what he's doing. He's doing lots of uh, really cool phenomenology in that very first paragraph. So for example, if you read the last sentence there, uh, it must have the penetrating power equal to 10 times larger than gamma radiation. Again, that's to, uh, to solve experimental issues because we've never seen one of these, in quotes, neutrons do anything. Okay, so this is what Pauli was doing. So the, the last paragraph uh, is, a, is a more philosophical par paragraph. And uh, what he does in that paragraph is that, first of all, uh, he's complaining that what, what he's doing feels like cheating because he's inventing a new particle to solve a problem. And that sounded wrong. And of course, uh, today we do that on a daily basis, but that's a separate problem. And then he has some more philosophical statements in the, in the middle. And then towards the end, he tries to explain why he didn't get to go to the conference, because he's, he had to go to a party. There's a lot of debates about why Pauli didn't go to the meeting. Some people say he was kind of scared of making this bold presentation. I'm not sure if I buy that because he was Pauli and he was already famous at the time, so I don't know if he was scared of that. But the one thing which I forgot to mention is, uh, you know, the way that you solve this problem here is very simple. You have a nucleus that decays instead of this way, it decays into a three-body final state, and that solves the problem because now all of this energy here, instead of being uh, shot out with the electron, it is split between the electron and, the, and the, the thing that we call the neutrino today. Okay, so this is a very, very simple kinematical solution to this problem. And this is what Pauli came up with in uh, December of 1930. So a lot of really cool things happen uh, relatively quickly after that. A very interesting thing that happened was uh, in 1932, uh, Chadwick in Great Britain was doing uh, more of these nuclear physics experiments, and then he found a new particle, which didn't have any charge, and he called it the neutron. And uh, this was in 1932, and this is kind of a big deal, and everybody learned about it very quickly, and again, the story goes, and this may or may not be true, but I think it's true, was that a, a Fermi was giving a talk or he was giving an interview. I don't remember if it was a talk on an interview. And then somebody asked him, hey, Chadwick found this particle called the, the neutron. And Pauli, two years ago, postulated that there's a new particle called the neutron. So did Chadwick discover uh, uh, Pauli's neutron? And then Fermi said, no, no, no. The neutron that Chadwick discovered is actually quite heavy. It weighs as much as a proton does. The neutron that, uh, uh, that Pauli predicted is very, very light. So it's not a neutron. You know, Pauli's neutron is a small neutron. And he was giving the interview in, in, in Italian. So in Italian, if you want to say a small neutron, you say a neutrino. It's a little neutron. So if you know Latin languages, it makes perfect sense. So Fermi called it a neutrino, and somehow the name stuck. This is actually kind of cool because uh, this uh, I-N-O suffix, which in Italian means a small, uh, that got hijacked by physics, and this I-N-O started to become a fermion. So you have things like a charginos and neutralinos and supersymmetric theories, which are not small and not very light, but they end in I-N-O because they're, they're uh, fermions. So this is what happened in 1932. In 1934, uh, uh, Fermi did something much more important than just calling the neutrino something. He actually wrote down a theory for weak interactions. So the first theory of weak interactions was written down by Fermi, and it's a very, very crazy theory. It's revolutionary, and it's still the, the way in which we think about these processes today. So again, this is in the early 1930s. People knew about uh, electromagnetism very well. We were starting to develop you know, quantum electrodynamics. And, uh, and in particular, uh, people knew how to describe, say, electromagnetic processes. And there's a class or a large class of electromagnetic processes that you can, des that you can describe by what are called current-current interactions. So hopefully that's vaguely familiar to people. 
So Fermi said, I want to describe these uh, uh, you know, weak decay processes, and I also want to use a, a current-current interaction language, except that he invented what's called a charged current. And basically, he invented a physics process through which the nature of the particle could change with the physics process. So basically, you know, the, the electromagnetism current that you know about is like an electron-electron current talking to another electron-electron current. And we say that it works like that. But effectively, it's a, it's a current-current kind of interaction. This electron current has a J mu nature to it. This has another J mu nature to it. And the coupling of that is the thing that you add in your perturbation theory. So he wanted to do something similar, except that he allowed for these currents to, to change the kind of particle. And in particular, he said that you know, maybe there's a physics process that looks like this, where a neutron uh, magically converts into a proton, and then it talks to another current that looks like this. So again, and we don't know what's going on here, but uh, this is what he postulated. So the key thing was that he took this idea here, and he generalized it in this really weird way, where somehow one kind of a particle could disappear, and then a different one would appear. And uh, you should be very impressed by this, because this is very, very non-trivial. We were already accustomed with, uh, for example, photons appearing out of nothing. We knew that that could happen. But again, the photon is special. It's a boson. It doesn't have any mass. All kinds of interesting stuff are associated to photons. We also grew accustomed with the idea that you could create a particle-antiparticle pair out of uh, the vacuum. So again, you could have a physics process where two things collide, and then any plus, any minus come out. And uh, we also grew accustomed to that idea. But that's not too crazy, because again, we also know that a particle and an antiparticle can annihilate into energy. So again, it just means that energy can transform itself into a particle and an antiparticle pair. This is a qualitatively different idea, but not super crazy idea. But it just means that it is possible to destroy one kind of particle and create another kind of particle. So this is what uh, uh, Fermi did. So he wrote down that very, very famous uh, Hamiltonian, which we still use today. <clears throat> and uh, this is again in 1934. Uh, we didn't know what kind of a current this was. And uh, this is another piece of history which took a very long time to figure out. So again, uh, when I say kind of current, this is a vector current. People were smart enough, they already knew you could have a vector current, a pseudoscalar current, an axial vector current, a tensor current. They had classified all of those. And we didn't know what kind of a current that was. And curiously enough, it took about 20 years to figure that out, just because the measurements were hard to make. So experimentally, that was a big problem to solve. But nonetheless, what's really nice about uh, the Fermi theory <clears throat> is uh, it allows you to do calculations, because now it's a theory. So you can actually calculate stuff. And in particular, since you can describe beta decay and you can do a calculation of that, you can also calculate other things. And in particular, you could calculate, uh, let's say, this physics process here. And you could calculate the cross-section for that, or what's the likelihood that a neutrino will hit something, produce a positron and a neutron. And we'll come back to that reaction in just a second. But the first thing that happens is if you, ask, if you calculate the cross-section for that, which is the likelihood that this will happen, the cross-section is laughably small. It's super, super tiny. So what people said at the time was that, OK, good. The cross-section for this is so small, we'll never, ever, ever get to measure this, ever. There's a lot of stories about that. One is the first estimates were a little bit wrong. The cross-section was uh, maybe an order of magnitude bigger, which is still very small. The other thing that happened is uh, there's a story that Pauli made a bet. And he bet that nobody would ever see the neutrino that he had invented. Uh, he lost the bet. But he almost won. And it's very important to keep this in mind. You know, the, the neutrino was invented in 1930. 
the first time somebody saw a neutrino do something was in the mid-1950s, which is 25 years later. This was almost as long as we had to wait to discover the Higgs boson. Okay, just something to keep in mind. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's what was going on there. And uh, I want to mention a couple of other things that were happening at the same time, because this will be important for us in a second. One is, uh, this is in 1930, oh, I forgot to say, by the mid-1930s, we had given up the nuclear physics model from the 1920s, and we had a much better model, which was to say that nuclei are made out of protons and neutrons. And then the neutron would decay in that way, so that would explain the beta radiation without you having to put a bunch of electrons uh, uh, inside of the nucleus as well. And that model works much, much better. So we even believe that that's true today, right? You know, the nuclei are mostly made out of protons and neutrons. And of course, once you postulate that, the next step is to understand how the protons and neutrons talk to each other to stay bound inside of a nucleus. And that's what people were working on. And of course, uh, we knew about electromagnetism. And you probably have noticed by now, if you keep studying particle physics, is that everything kind of looks like electromagnetism. Right? Because that worked so well, it must be true for everything else. So that's what uh, people were working on. Let's postulate that there is a force between protons and neutrons, which is kind of like electromagnetism, except that it is very, very strong at very short distances. Because uh, it has to be stronger than electromagnetism to allow the protons to bind together, because the protons like to repel. But of course, we know that if you take one proton and you shoot another proton at it, uh, whatever this force is, for the most part, it doesn't do anything because the protons are so far away. Right? So if two protons are very far away, they will talk to each other via electromagnetism. They will not talk to each other via this uh, strong force unless they, get, they come close together. So there's this very, very famous theory by a guy named uh, Yukawa in Japan, where he postulated that you had something like a Coulomb potential that explains how protons and neutrons bind together, except that that interaction has a short range. So instead of having a regular Coulomb uh, 1 over r potential, you have a 1 over r potential multiplied by an exponential. And you could guess the strength of the exponential by the range of this uh, 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 nuclear force. And by looking at the range of the nuclear force, uh, you would get a number out of that. And that number can be associated with uh, the mass of whatever particle it is, just like the photon that mediates electromagnetism. There would be a new particle that mediates this nuclear force, and the mass of that is proportional to the range of the nuclear force. So what Yukawa did in 1935 was to postulate or to estimate what's the mass of this new particle. And the mass was pretty heavy, but not too heavy. It was about 100 MeV. Okay? You can get that just by measurements of the nuclear force. And uh, that particle with a mass of about 100 MeV was called a meson. So do people know why a meson is called a meson? Do you know what mesons are? Because people are too young nowadays. So you've heard the word meson. So why is it called a meson? What's that? Yep. Yeah, that, that's so, so, so the mesons have a mass which is in between the proton mass and the electron mass. It's kind of in the middle, so it's called a meson. It's a really stupid name. It's also stuck, and we use that. So Yukawa postulated that, and uh, the thing which is very um, uh, amazing and amusing is that one year later, People actually discovered a new particle doing cosmic ray, ex cosmic ray experiments, and the mass of that particle is 100 MeV, which is absolutely amazing. So imagine that you're Yukawa, and you postulate a new particle that weighs 100 MeV, and then the year, next year, somebody discovers a new particle that weighs 100 MeV, which is really cool, except that people were very confused. Okay. Because that particle didn't do the right thing. So that particle was discovered in cosmic rays. And uh, you can actually measure that particle here. 
or, or by the, the ocean, which is m more pleasant. You can do the experiment there, and you see those particles there. And people figured out that those things were, pr were produced in the atmosphere about 50 kilometers above us. And that was very strange, because that particle really liked to talk to, to, uh, to nucleons, you know, to protons and neutrons and nuclei in general, because it was the mediator of this uh, nuclear force. So how can those things get all the way from the upper atmosphere down here? People had no idea how that happened. It was very strange because that particle, you actually got the right amount of those particles by any estimates that you can make. But somehow, uh, that particle wasn't behaving properly after it was produced. Okay? So this was very, very strange, and it was a mystery for about a decade. And, uh, the solution to that is a very strange solution, which is to say that uh, the cosmic rays are coming from somewhere, they hit the atmosphere, they produce the Yukawa meson, but somehow the Yukawa meson decays really quickly into a new particle. So this is the model. So the Yukawa meson is nowadays called the pion, and then the pion would decay into a new particle, and it turns out it's a two-body decay. It looks like that. So this was the hypothesis that was put forward. Again, it's a really, really stupid hypothesis because it's very simple. It's also right. Okay. So this at the time was called the, the two meson hypothesis. And uh, so the new particle that people had actually measured was a muon, not the pion, which is the Yukawa meson. So it's kind of a weird story. It took about a decade to figure this out. And the way that this was resolved, by the way, was also experimentally. So again, the, the, the idea is a theoretical idea. This was resolved by experiments. And the way that you do that is that you go high up in the atmosphere. And then you could see, you could see the pions directly from cosmic rays. So this is kind of what happened. And then, of course, what people did is that they discovered the muon. Then they started measuring the properties of the muon. First of all, the muon was not a strongly interacting particle. It only interacted via electromagnetism. So as everybody knows, the muon is more like an electron than a pion. And uh, then people figured out that the muon also decayed, and it decays in this way. And I'm, gonna, I'm always using this uh, modern notation, but we'll come back to this. Again, the muon, it turns out, has a decay that looks a lot like beta decay. So the muon would decay this way. They also figured out that the pion decayed that way, which is also kind of like a beta decay. It's a two-body final state beta decay. But these are all different manifestations of the strong interactions, and oh, sorry, the weak interactions. And the other thing that people figured out was that uh, all of these different processes could be explained by the equivalent of a Fermi's theory, up to order one factors that we only figured out a very long time after that. But that was also a big deal because it gave some uh, universality nature to the cell weak interactions. So it's not like there's one kind of weak interactions for pion decay, one kind of weak interactions for beta decay, and one kind of weak interactions for uh, muon decay, but these are all manifestations of the same interaction. OK, so again, this is what was going on in the 1940s. And uh, there are a couple of things. So let's go back to talking about neutrinos. And uh, the pions are going to be important for something else. And uh, remember, we got over here to the mid-1930s. We could calculate the cross-section for an, a reaction that looked like that. And we figured out that the cross-section was super small. So people said, OK, we'll never be able to detect this. And then something happened. So we're getting to the 1940s, and, and as we are very well aware, uh, something very special happened in the 1940s, in the early 1940s. And the big thing that happened was uh, we had a big war. There was a world war that was going on, and that turned out to be very important for neutrino physics. Because what happened was, uh, even though this cross-section was super small, if you had a powerful enough source of neutrinos, uh, you could make up for that. And that's kind of what happened. So I'm skipping this. <laughs> 
So there was a serious campaign to try to observe the neutrinos directly, again, using that reaction over there. And the motivation for that was that people had figured out ways of getting very, very intense sources of neutrinos. Okay, so this is the thing which is qualitatively different. And uh, neutrinos was first discovered in 1956. And uh, by uh, the people associated to that are uh, Rhinus and Kaun. They actually got the Nobel Prize for discovering the electron neutrino. And uh, neutrinos are ultimately discovered in a reactor experiment. And again, reactors are a side effect of the Second World War. Basically, a reactor is a place where you put a lot of radioactive material. And they just do what they're supposed to do. And of course, we use them to get energy out. I do want to say that uh, the first proposal that Rhinus and Cowan made was using a different kind of neutrino source. And uh, this was only a proposal. It's a really cool proposal. And uh, what was also going on at the time, uh, sadly, was that people were getting good at building nuclear weapons. And it turns out uh, that the explosion of a nuclear bomb is an amazing source of neutrinos. So if you want to get a lot of neutrinos, uh, you should go right next to a nuclear explosion to do your experiment. So this is the idea. This, by the way, is from a proposal at Los Alamos. And uh, the proposal was encouraged but never funded because it had some problems. Uh, but that's the idea. So on top of that tower there, there's a nuclear bomb that's going off. At the time, the United States was doing a lot of tests. So there were these explosions going on in the desert somewhere. And the idea is you place your detector relatively close to the explosion because the neutrino flux is very large. So that's the main idea. Now, the technical problem is uh, you need to make this measurement while there's a big explosion going on, which makes it for a very, very difficult measurement to make. So they had a really good idea, which they never tried out, is that in order for you to avoid the explosion, you wanted to have your detector in free fall, which is a good idea because you have to figure, you know, imagine that your detector is falling. You know, the ground is shaking and all kinds of bad things are happening, but your detector is just falling. So it doesn't sense all of that uh, shaking that's going on at the same time. And then, of course, you make it land somewhere nice, you know, this feathers and foam rubber, and hopefully your experiment will survive. So uh, they never got to do this experiment. By the way, nobody ever did, as far as I know, get to measure the neutrino flux from a nuclear bomb, which is probably a good thing. So instead, they did the experiment with a nuclear reactor. And a nuclear reactor is like a, a really inefficient uh, nuclear bomb that just blows up very, very, very slowly. Okay? So it's almost as good. You get a very large flux of, uh, of uh, neutrinos coming from the nuclear reactor. And the neutrinos were actually measured using this reaction here. And uh, I want to talk about that for just a minute because uh, we still measure neutrinos this way today. Okay, we're measuring neutrinos is still very hard. Uh, so this reaction is a very famous reaction where the neutrino comes in, it hits something. So whatever that something is, it has lots of protons in it. So that part is easy. We can get lots of protons in lots of different ways. And then it converts the proton into a neutron and you get a positron. So it's kind of the, uh, the inverse of this reaction here. This is sometimes called uh, inverse beta decay because you're converting protons into neutrons. And from an experimental point of view, your signal is a positron. That's, your, that's what you see. Positrons are nice because they will annihilate with some electron in the medium and they will give you some gamma rays and you can measure the energies of the gamma rays. Uh, the big challenge for this is uh, even though your nuclear reactor is a good source of neutrinos, you still need a gigantic detector to measure this. So you need a really big detector that sits there close to your nuclear reactor. And the problem is, at the same time, there's all kinds of other junk going on that will look like a positron. And remember, the positron is not really a positron. It's just some electromagnetic energy that's detected in your detector. So basically, it's like a blip. You know, it's like a count in your detector of electromagnetic radiation. 
So lots of things look like that. For example, gamma radiation from nuclear decays looks exactly like this. All kinds of junk look exactly like that. So the question is, how do we get around this in order to detect that this is the reaction that's going on and not just some uh, 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 slow gamma decay process in my, there's no slow, so nuclear physics processes that will mess this up. The solution turns out to be the neutron. So this process here gives you a positron and a, fe a free neutron. And what people figured out is that the free neutron will move around in your detector until it gets absorbed by some nucleus. And then the nucleus will be in some excited state, and then it will emit some gamma radiation. And what's really nice is that the neutron has a characteristic time that it takes to be captured by uh, uh, the medium. That's easy to understand. The neutrons that come out of this are relatively hot, meaning they have a lot of energy. That means they have to move around a little bit to lose energy until they get captured by some nucleus. So there's a characteristic time associated to that. So you basically get this really nice signal, which is you see a signal from the positron. You wait a fixed amount of time, and then you should see the signal from the neutron being captured and then giving you gamma radiation. So this is what's called a coincidence signal, which means that not only do you see this, but a little bit afterwards you have to see that. And nuclear physics processes in general don't look like that. So by looking at this coincidence here, you could get rid of your nuclear physics backgrounds, and then you could discover the neutrino. And uh, this is what they did in the 1950s. Uh, I forgot to mention this. Uh, I guess I didn't write it on the slide. Uh, if, you want, if you want to learn more about this, there was a first measurement in one nuclear reactor that they weren't very sure about. Then they moved to this other nuclear reactor in Savannah River, and that's where they made the discovery. Uh, this, uh, this whole enterprise is called the Project Poltergeist. So you can look that up. It's a really cool uh, little history there. And uh, they wanted to see something that was impossible to see. And by the late 1950s, Pauli had lost his bet. I think he paid like a bottle of champagne or a case of champagne to somebody. I'm sure he didn't mind. So that was it. OK, so continuing the story, there's something interesting that happens in the late 1950s as well is that people managed to measure the spin of the neutrinos, and they also managed to measure what's called the helicity of the neutrino. And uh, I'm not going to talk about this very much. This is in 1958. There's a very clever nuclear physics experiment where you have uh, this nucleus called the europium. It undergoes weak electron capture. That means it captures an electron converts into another weird nucleus like samarium and emits a neutrino, and the samarium immediately decays into a photon. So if you look on the left-hand side, you have an electron going into samarium plus a photon, and because we can measure the photon polarization, and because I wrote something wrong, the, the ground state of samarium has no spin, uh, by measuring the polarization of the photon, you could infer the polarization of the neutrino that's being emitted as well. And the only reason I'm talking about this is that people figured out that neutrinos not only had spin one half, but in, in uh, reactions where neutrinos are produced, the neutrinos are always 100% polarized. So the neutrinos are always left-handed. Antineutrinos are always right-handed. Yeah. Everybody. Very good. Yeah, in those experiments, it's always a charge current interaction. Is there, in general, a possibility to measure the helicity of a neutrino in neutral current? That's a very good question. Uh, yes, we, can, we try to do that, and uh, it's very difficult. It has to also come from neutrino scattering, and we can do neutrino scattering via... So let me, uh, let me qualify that a little bit better. So, it's very, very difficult to measure the, hel the helicity of the neutrino from a neutral current interaction for the following reason. Uh, if you want to do a neutrino scattering experiment, the neutrinos are always produced by charged current interactions, which means that your beam is going to be 100% polarized. So if you have a 100% polarized beam, even if you do a neutron scattering experiment afterwards, 
your beam is, in quotes, polluted because it's 100% polarized. Uh, but we can still measure that. So we can measure the strength of left-handed neutrino scattering on, for example, an electron. So let's say you do new mu scattering on electron. That's a purely neutral current process. So if you do this process here, That's a purely neutral current process, and people have measured this as well as they can. There's a couple of experiments. There's a CHARM2 experiment that did a pretty good job of that. So you have a 100% polarized new mu beam, and you can measure the strength of this. It doesn't tell you about the helicity of the neutrino because you have a 100% polarized beam. However, we can then measure, for example, uh, Z decay. And from Z decay, we can also measure the strength of the coupling of the neutrino to the Z boson. That measurement doesn't know that the neutrino is left-handed. They could have been 100% right-handed. But if you compare this with the Z decay, for example, and you compare the strengths of that, the strength of the Z decay is as strong as the strength of this purely left-handed new mu scattering process. So you can infer relatively indirectly that, that the neutral current is also purely left-handed. Uh, but it's very difficult to get good information on that because the neutrinos are always 100% polarized in the initial state. And uh, we have a couple of other handles, but that's the, that's, that's the answer to that. Very good. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll come back and talk about this more. So again, this is 1958. Then in the 1960s, people came back to uh, looking at the muon. Okay. This is another great story, which is uh, very, very important to know, which is, again, I said the muon was discovered in the 1930s. There's a, a big gap in particle physics, again, because of the Second World War, when people were busy doing uh, other stuff. And then when they came back, by studying properties of the muon, uh, first of all, they figured out that the muon decayed this way. And uh, they also figured out that the muon really did look like a heavy electron. So the muon was the first second generation particle to be discovered. Uh, there are lots and lots of stories associated with the muon. Uh, the most uh, interesting one that you want to remember is uh, when people figured out that the muon was a heavy electron, there's a very famous quote that says, uh, who ordered that? Which is, uh, the interpretation is, what are muons good for? Why would anybody invent this? We still don't know what the answer is, but that's still a quote. And uh, the key thing about muons is uh, if the muon really is like a, an electron but heavier, the first thing that people thought when they were trying to understand what a muon was, uh, was to say that you know, maybe the electron is kind of like a nucleus, and maybe the muon is an excited state of that nucleus you know, that makes up the electron. So the question that people thought was, so why doesn't the muon uh, undergo gamma radiation. So why doesn't it do that? It's a fair question to ask. Nuclei know how to do this. So why doesn't the muon do that? And people started looking for this decay, the muon going to an electron and a photon, and, and they never saw it. So they put a bound on the, on the likelihood that this happens, and let's say that they got to like 10 to minus 2, a percent, 0.1 percent, and they say, okay, so this model is not a good model. But now let's go back to how the muon decays, which is this way. And uh, we can draw a Feynman diagram for that. Uh, it's a diagram that looks like this. And it goes like that. So people said, OK, so the muon decays this way. And it's certainly not uh, going to undergo uh, gamma radiation kind of decay. But one thing I can do is, uh, here's a neutrino, here's an antineutrino. I can close a loop here that goes like that, and then I can attach a photon somewhere. And then I get to do this decay. Okay, I can do this calculation, and people did that. And the branching ratio that you estimate just by knowing about regular muon decay uh, was a branching ratio of about 10 to the minus 4, which is small. And people kept doing experiments with muons, and they figured out that this did not happen at the 10 to the minus 4 level. And just uh, as a spoiler alert, uh, 
We keep looking for this. If you don't follow this literature, uh, we know that this doesn't happen at the 10 and minus 12 level, which is super small. Okay, and we have never seen this happen before. So the puzzle at the time was, why doesn't this happen? I mean, it has to happen, right? You know, that's uh, it's a simple thing that, that you can do in a Feynman diagram calculation. And in order for this not to happen, uh, people invented what's called the, the two neutrino hypothesis. And the idea was to invent a new quantum number. So you, so you basically look at this reaction and you say, okay, this never happens. There must be a reason for this. So you, you invent two new quantum numbers. Uh, one is called the muon number. The other one is called the electron number. So the muon has muon number one. The electron has muon number zero. The electron has electron number one. And the muon has muon, uh, electron number zero. So this is forbidden by electron number conservation and muon number conservation. Of course, the muon has to decay this way, which means that the two neutrinos that come out have to carry different quantum numbers. So this one has electron number, and this one has muon number. That's why they get these indices like that. And that explains how the muon can decay. And the price you pay for this is that now you have two different kinds of neutrinos, the electron neutrino and the muon neutrino. So that's the two neutrino hypothesis. It was invented, or people came up with that, to explain why mu to e gamma doesn't happen. Okay, that was the reason for that. And uh, how do you test this experimentally? The idea is relatively simple. As I am sure everybody knows, the pion really likes to decay this way, and it never decays to electrons. So the pion decays this way into a muon and the neutrino. Because of this uh, muon number conservation, this neutrino here is the muon neutrino. So if I could do an experiment with this guy, so imagine that this guy comes in and it hits something. If it does that, uh, it has to produce a muon, and it never produces a positron. So this is the experiment you want to do. You want to make a beam of these neutrinos. This is uh, what's written over here. So you shoot protons on a target. Oh, this is wrong. You shoot protons on a target. You get a bunch of pions. The pions decay. And then the muon hits something. And then you ask what happens uh, at the end. Do you only produce muons or do you actually produce electrons? And the answer is people did this experiment in the early 1960s. And they figured out that you never, ever produce an electron. You always produce a muon. And one thing you want to keep in mind is, of course, the electron is lighter than the muon. So if the reaction on the bottom could happen, it would happen more frequently. So that means that by doing this experiment, uh, you actually convinced yourself that the muon neutrino and the electron neutrinos are different particles. This is another Nobel Prize winning experiment by Letterman, Steinberg, and Schwartz. And, and I wrote Schwartz wrong. It ends with a Z for obvious reasons. It was done at Brookhaven. And uh, I am told that Schwartz was the guy who did the whole work, who did all the work. He was also a graduate student. So keep that in mind. And uh, this experiment is famous for lots of different things. The most important thing is that they invented a neutrino beam. So this is a, a beam of neutrinos that all go in the same direction, more or less. And we still produce neutrino beams exactly this way. And that's probably the main reason they got the Nobel Prize, uh, other than convincing everybody that there are two kinds of neutrinos. There's a joke people like to tell, which is the, the Nobel Prize for the muon neutrino came before the Nobel Prize for the electron neutrino, which means that the second neutrino got the Nobel Prize before the first neutrino did. Finally, uh, to end this part of the story, what happens in the 1970s is that we, we discovered a whole bunch of new particles. In particular, we discovered the tau lepton. The tau lepton is like the muon and the electron, but it's heavier. And immediately, people postulated that there must be a third kind of neutrino called the tau neutrino. And the tau neutrino must also be able to interact with stuff and, uh, and produce a tau lepton. And uh, this was discovered only in 2001. So this is also something to keep in mind. Uh, so 
direct evidence for tau leptons only showed, uh, for tau neutrinos, uh, only happened uh, this century, not last century. And uh, I always like to say, this is uh, seven years after the top quark was discovered. So the last fermion to be discovered was the tau neutrino, not the top quark, by a lot. This was actually discovered at Fermilab. The idea is very, very similar. You, you want to produce a bunch of these tau neutrinos, and you want to see them uh, producing a tau lepton. Uh, studying tau neutrinos is very, very hard. One thing which I want to say is uh, if we look at the world's neutrino data today, or up to today, and we ask how many tau neutrinos we have ever seen do this, you know, so that we have, you know, hardcore evidence that this is what was going on. The answer is we've seen about 10 of those ever, okay? We have a lot of indirect evidence for tau neutrinos, uh, but, but to identify a tau neutrino event uh, one by one, I think we've seen about 10 of those. So keep that in mind. It's not the particle we know the best. And uh, these are really, really cool experiments, so I want to say something about those. That's not it. This is, uh, this is how you look for tau leptons. The idea is really nice because what happens is you have a, you have a, a tau neutrino comes in, it hits something, and it produces a tau. Now what happens with the tau is uh, the tau lifetime is long enough that it can actually propagate a little bit before it decays, and one of the tau decay modes is into a muon. So, so the tau goes this way, just like the muon does. So you see the tau, it propagates a little bit, and then it decays into a muon. And what's nice is uh, you get something that's good to look for, which is a signal that looks like this. So a neutrino's coming in from over here, nothing happens, it hits something, produces a tau, and then the tau moves a little bit, and then it decays this way, and this is the muon. So here's a tau, here's a muon, and all the neutrinos are invisible. And this is uh, the experiment that you want to do. And of course, uh, this is one event. This is another event. Again, the tau is moving over here. It decays into a muon and some neutrinos that you don't see. There's another one over here. Then there's another one over here. And this is almost all the events of the donut experiment. That's it. That's all the events. Uh, one thing that you want to appreciate is that uh, your, your detections are actually these are red points and the green points. So you have to reconstruct these trajectories to identify these kinks. And what makes these experiments super hard is uh, in order to have this tau neutrino beam, you're basically doing something very similar to this experiment. You're shooting protons on a target. You're producing a lot of junk. And in order to produce a tau neutrino, you need to produce something that decays into taus. And the first thing that does that is a strange charm quark. It's called the D sub S. So the D sub S likes to go into tau and a new tau. So that's how you produce your, D, your new tau beam. Sadly, when you do that, you also produce a whole lot of pions and kaons. And the pions and kaons still decay, and they decay mostly into muon neutrinos and some electron neutrinos. So basically, in order to produce a new tau beam, even if you're super clever, the fraction of the neutrinos that are actually going to be uh, of the type that you're looking for is less than a percent. So most of the neutrinos are going to be muon neutrinos, and the muon neutrinos are very, very similar to this event, except that they don't have the kink. You know, instead of producing a tau and a muon, they just produce a muon directly. So that's how you distinguish your events, and that's why this is a big deal. I do like to show this picture, because this is how your experiment really looks like. This is a photographic experiment. What this means is uh, you don't see this in an event-by-event -event basis. Your tracks actually leave a mark in your experiment. So every time there's a track, you get a mark in your experiment. So things literally look like this. And the claim is that there's one of these interesting events there. So the challenge is how do you find it? And that's where the art of the experiment goes, is how do you identify out of all of these uh, tracks, the track that you're looking for. So there's this very complex process of uh, cleaning out your, this is an emotion detector. 
which I forgot to say. Emotion is a technology that was used to discover the pion in uh, cosmic rays, and people got better at it, but it's still the same technology. It's just like a photographic plate. So this is the discovery of the tau neutrino. Okay, and that's the end of this part of the story. And uh, now I want to summarize where we were with neutrinos, and then I want to start talking about uh, uh, weird stuff that was going on in terms of data, and of course I won't be able to finish that. But just to summarize, this is everything we knew about neutrinos by uh, the end of the last century, more or less. If you open like a Peskin's book, uh, that's how neutrinos are, dis are discussed for the most part. If you open an older quantum field theory book, uh, that's also how neutrinos are going to be discovered. They're very easy. Uh, one thing is uh, they only interact via the weak interactions. That means that they only talk to the W and the Z. As far as we know, and this is something that I already alluded to, and there's even a question, uh, all of the neutrinos that are ever produced are left-handed. All of the antineutrinos that are ever produced are right-handed. Now, this is a side effect of the maximally parity violating nature of the weak interactions, which you have heard about. It's the V minus A character of the current. And though there's nothing we can do about that, but we can exploit it. Of course, the neutrinos come in three different flavors the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And that's characterized by whom they talk to uh, when they undergo a charge current interaction. So the electron neutrino talks to electrons, the muon neutrino talks to muons, the tau neutrino talks to taus. And uh, so this is this piece here, this is this other piece here. The thing I want to come back to and talk about a lot is uh, until very, very recently, we thought that neutrino masses were exactly zero. And, uh, and I'll come back and try to explain that probably by Friday. And uh, like I said, all of the neutrinos are left-handed. All of the antineutrinos are right-handed. And finally, the last thing, which I'll also come back to, is uh, like I said, you know, the, the electron, muon, and tau neutrinos carry these conserved quantum numbers, muon number, electron number, and tau number. And they also carry what's called a total lepton number. And uh, the idea is that neutrinos have lepton number plus, uh, charged leptons have lepton number plus. Their antiparticles have lepton number minus. And uh, as far as we can tell, uh, this is also a conserved law of nature, and I'll come back to this as well. Okay, so for the last 10 minutes, I want to start talking about uh, what happened. So, and I won't have time to finish talking about this at all, but what happened is, starting out in the 1960s, uh, neutrinos started to do uh, weird things. So they were not obeying the, the laws that I was, or, or the properties that I was describing in the last uh, uh, slide. And this is a problem that did start out in the 1960s. People didn't believe it for a very long time. And it was only definitively confirmed in the early 2000s. So again, it was a 50-year-old problem that took a lot of convincing for people to believe that uh, those experiments were actually correct. Okay? And the evidence that we have is, uh, if you look at this picture here, we found out that it's possible to produce an electron neutrino or a muon neutrino somewhere. And when those neutrinos get detected, they actually behave like a different kind of neutrino. So we have evidence that muon neutrinos sometimes behave like tau neutrinos. Electron neutrinos behave like other kinds of neutrinos. Electron antineutrinos behave like something else. And muon neutrinos also behave like something else if you allow them to propagate long enough. So that was the, the, the caveat to the story, is that if you do the experiment right away, the neutrinos behave like they should. But if you wait uh, long enough, they have this non-zero probability of uh, behaving as a different flavor. This uh, flavor transition capabilities depend on the neutrino energy, and they also depend on how much time you wait, or how far away the source and the detector are. So this is what we discovered. And uh, I want to start out by telling you about the oldest problem, which is a kind of a fun problem, and that's probably where I'll stop today, which is, uh, it's called the solar neutrino problem. This is a very, very old story. It's a really cool story. 
And uh, it goes back to a very old physics problem that people had been pondering about for a very long time, like you know, hundreds of years, ever since like Newton. And the question is, uh, how does the sun work? Because the sun is a very, very efficient source of uh, energy. Right? So, the, so somehow there's a lot of energy coming from the sun. And the question is, where is that energy coming from? We believe in conservation of energy. So whatever that energy is coming from, we have to see it. And uh, one estimate that people did for a long time is they, they calculated, for example, the gravitational energy that's contained in the sun just by binding it. And then they asked, you know, maybe that's the source of the power that's coming from the sun. And that turns out to be totally wrong. That doesn't work at all. It's a very, very tiny amount of energy. So the answer to this problem only happened in the 20th century because of nuclear physics. So nuclear physics allows us to convert mass into energy very, very efficiently. So the sun is basically uh, killing itself by converting its mass into electromagnetic radiation. And that's how the sun works. And it's so efficient a process that the sun has a really long lifetime. Even though it's uh, destroying itself, it'll take a long time for that to happen. So we all know about this. It took people a long time to figure out how does this happen in detail. And the model that w won is this thing called the proton fusion. So this, the interior of the sun is very, very dense. And what happens there is that two protons can fuse into deuteron. This is a weak process, by the way. So you get a deuteron, you get a positron, and an electron neutrino. Uh, other stuff happens. At the end of the day, you end up producing a helium-4 plus electromagnetic radiation. That's most of what's going on in the sun. Is a, if, if you want to think about it, four protons come together, then fuse into helium-4, two positrons and two neutrinos, and a lot of electromagnetic radiation. Now, the thing that's really important is that you get these neutrinos. And the neutrinos come out because they don't interact very much. So that means that at the same time that you're producing this electromagnetic radiation, you're also producing neutrinos. By the way, other stuff also happens. You don't just produce helium-4. You produce other elements as well. And in all of these processes here, you're producing electron neutrinos. So if this model is correct, the sun is producing a whole lot of electron neutrinos along with the radiation. So if you wanted to test this, you should try to measure these electron neutrinos coming from the sun. That was, uh, uh, that was the idea. So the question is, how do we do that? The answer is it's super hard because the flux of electron neutrinos is not huge. It's large, but it's not gigantic. And the neutrinos are neutrinos. So that's the other part of the problem. There are lots of stories associated to this, which I won't get into the details. But we can, we're very predictive on this. And uh, this is a calculation of the differential flux of neutrinos coming from the sun. And uh, oh, this button is weird. And this is, the, this is the neutrinos that come out for the most part. This is a lot of neutrinos, but they're very, very low energy neutrinos. And these are all the different kinds of neutrinos that come out. These neutrinos all get names, and they have to do with what's the physics process that's going on inside of the sun that leads to these neutrinos. And the key thing we want to remember is that the energies are below about 10 MeV, and most of them are super low energy. What this thing here also contains is different kinds of experiments that people constructed in order to measure the flux of neutrinos from the sun. Okay? And uh, these experiments use different techniques. And the way that the earlier experiments worked was that you wanted to detect neutrinos by beta decay. So remember, this is beta decay. So you want to do inverse beta decay, which is a process that looks like this. So this is what you want to look for. This is a, a prime, sorry, not a minus. So it's one nucleus that gets converted into another nucleus. So that's what you want to measure. Now, this is a very hard experiment for lots of reasons. One reason is your signal is an electron, which is a really horrible signal. You don't look for that in all different kinds of experiments. Uh, some of the experiments, 
look for this, this nucleus that's appearing inside of your experiment. And the very first experiment was done with chlorine. And the experiment is very simple. It's a very, very, very big tank of chlorine. Now, chlorine is very easy to get. You can go to the supermarket and buy chlorine. That's your experiment. So you take a, you know, a, a gigantic volume out of chlorine. You build a very big tank inside of a mine that was done in, in South Dakota in the United States. It was a gold mine at the time. So you build this gigantic tank. You know, it's like the size of a very big swimming pool. You fill it up with chlorine. You can't do pure chlorine. It's some chlorine mixed with hydrogen and other stuff. And then the neutrinos come in. They hit the chlorine, and they convert it into argon, which is good. Argon is, is a, a noble gas. That means when the argon is produced inside of your chlorine tank, nothing ha it just kind of sits there. So you then filter out the chlorine, and then you get the argon atoms out. The other thing that's very, very nice is that the argon that you produce is a radioactive kind of argon, which means it decays after a certain amount of time. That means that you basically have this big tank, you produce a argon inside of the big tank, and you filter it, you get the argon gas out, and then the argons decay, and then they let you know that they're there, which is nice. So this is the experiment that started off in the 1960s. And the key thing you want to remember, and that's the last thing I'll say, is that they did this experiment. And uh, this is a really, really crazy experiment because they would filter and make measurements, let's say, once a month. And out of this big swimming pool of uh, chlorine, they would get 10 atoms of argon. OK, that's, that's it. That's your signal. So it's 10 atoms per month out of a swimming pool of chlorine. They actually did the experiment. They did get a signal. And uh, this is also a Nobel Prize winning experiment, by the way. And uh, this is the first measurement of neutrinos from the sun. And the thing that's very important to remember, and that's where I'll start tomorrow, is uh, even though they made this measurement, the number of events that they get was about a third of the number of events that they expected. So they see a lot fewer neutrinos from the sun than they expected. So the good news are, they actually see neutrinos coming from the sun, which is an amazing measurement by itself. The bad news are that they don't see as many as they expected. And then uh, what we're going to do is to talk about uh, what does that mean uh, uh, starting next time. And I think that's exactly time, so good. <laughs>